Thank you, Yuri. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming out. I don't have Yuri's voice, <laughs> so if, uh, if I'm not carrying to the back of the room, I hope you'll let me know. It's always a delight to be here. One of the delights, of course, is to be among uh, you at Providence singing. Uh, being in the vicinity of Yuri singing is what I mean, of course. <laughs> 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 It was uh, a number of years ago, I was working through a, uh, the book of Revelation. I wrote a commentary on Revelation, and uh, I had been working on uh, Revelation 14, which is the scene of with 144,000 uh, are on Mount Zion. They're about ready to be harvested in martyrdom, ready to be taken up, and they're learning the songs of heaven as they're standing on Mount Zion. I thought, uh, this is what this is how you prepare for martyrdom. If you want to prepare for witness, you need to sing. Mm -hmm. About that time, I was visiting Providence, and I thought, this is a church that's ready for martyrdom. <laughs> 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 because a church that sings, uh, and I'm, I'm being perfectly serious about that. This is a church that is ready to witness boldly, no matter what. And you can hear it in the singing. Uh, that is uh, genuinely the way you prepare for martyrdom. It's one of the ways you prepare for martyrdom, and it's uh, particularly needed in our time. As Yuri said, I'm going to be talking about hope this evening. I'll talk for, uh, I hope, about 45 minutes and then leave time for questions for all of you. But uh, it's a topic, of course, that uh, needs some reflection in our time when hope is in short supply. And uh, this is a, a, a short part of a course that we've been offering at Theopolis. Uh, every year we develop one course that we take on the road. It's our road show. And we present the same course in a number of different cities. And this past year, it was uh, what should we hope for? So this is a portion of that of that course that uh, we offered over the past year. Before we begin, let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you that you are the God of hope. You are the God who pours out the Spirit so that we may be full of hope and abound in hope. Father, we pray as we consider this virtue, as we consider this gift this evening, that it wouldn't be simply a knowledge, but that we would be a people of hope, and that being a people of hope, we would shine like lights in the firmament, lights in a dark place, uh, in a hopeless world, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me start out with a basic definition of hope. This is a... a, a Kind of standard definition that philosophers use when they talk about hope and that is that hope is an anticipation or expectation of some future good that's also connected with a belief that that future good can be realized so hope obviously is a desire for something in the future it's an expectation for something in the future it's an expectation for something in the future that's good we have lots of expectations for things in the future that are not good, and those don't awaken hope. They awaken anxiety or fear. But it's not simply an expectation or desire for something in the future that makes it hope, at least by this definition. But it's the belief that what you hope for can actually be accomplished. And that means for some philosophers, when they talk about hope, there, are, there, are, there is such a thing as a baseless, irrational hope. You can have a desire for something good in the future that you don't have any good reason to believe is going to happen. And according to this definition, that doesn't really count as hope because it's both that desiring, excuse me, that desiring portion, <clears throat> that desiring portion, and it's also cognitive. It's a belief that's a necessary part of hope. Um, I think that definition has its limits. Uh, I think some of the some of the uh, most impressive examples of hope, the things that we think of when we think of uh, genuine, uh, deep-seated hope, don't really fit that definition. You think of somebody who's in a prison camp, prison of war camp, or in a concentration camp, hoping for release. As the years go on, there seems to be no rational foundation for hoping for release. And yet we admire people who keep hope alive in the midst of circumstances that seem hopeless. 
And then, of course, that definition also raises the question of what do we mean by a rational hope? What makes a hope reasonable? If you believe in a, an almighty, sovereign God, then you have a certain understanding of what a rational hope would be, what a reasonable hope would be. Uh, and if you don't believe in that kind of God, if you think that everything operates kind of by natural forces, then that's, uh, you have different standards of reasonableness or hope. But th that at least gives us, that definition at least gives us start, something to start with. Uh, hope is an expectation of future good. It's founded in some kind of reason, ex a, a belief that what you hope for can actually be accomplished. It's not something just reaching into the dark. You really believe that it can can be happen, that it can happen. Uh, keeping in mind that some of the best examples in the Bible, certainly of hope, are hopes that are not rationally grounded by any uh, by any normal uh, uh, a natural expectation or natural reasonableness. Abraham hopes against hope as he grows old. As Sarah, his barren wife, grows older and older, he hopes against hope. He keeps hoping even when every rational hope has been exhausted. He keeps hoping that the Lord is going to keep his promise, and the Lord does. But we'll at least start with that, that hope is a, an expectation of some future good, and it's based in some rational explanation or rational expectation. You have a belief that it can actually happen. And with that definition, I think we can say that we live in an increasingly hopeless world. People do not feel expectation of future good. And you can look at that at a lot of different levels. People have fears and anxieties about the future of our country. And that, that anxiety crosses the political spectrum. I mean, some people think that the fact that 75 million people voted for Trump is a sign that our, our country is about to collapse. Other people think that the fact that Trump didn't win is a sign that our country is close to collapse. That anxiety and fear for the future of our country is, uh, cuts across political positions. But it's also, you also have the uh, uh, expectations for uh, a prosperous life for your children. It's, it's no longer, that's no longer given that you're going to continue to have this growth from generation to generation. Your kids are gonna do better than you did. That's been the American dream, not just to achieve certain things, but that your kids are going to be able to achieve even more than you did. That has waned. People don't have that same expectation for future generations. One of the reasons, obviously, why we're in a crisis of hope, uh, a, an age of anxiety, the nearer reason is uh, the events of 2020, and we could add the events of the first half of 2021. It felt like the whole world was falling apart. Ground was shifting beneath our feet. Things that we thought were uh, uh, firm and unmovable moved. Uh, do we think uh, in February of 2020 that it was possible in the United States that people would be forced to close up their businesses uh, by, the, by local and state governments? That churches would be restricted in their ability to worship together. We, freedom of movement was drastically curtailed. I mean, these are things that we just took for granted up until early, the early part of last year. And we thought this was just the way the world worked, and certainly the way America worked. And suddenly that's all gone. And it wasn't, of course, just the pandemic and the lockdowns and all the responses to the pandemics, but all the other all the other political upheavals of the past year uh, that left us with the feeling that nothing is stable or secure. The ground is uh, shifting beneath our feet. The world seems to be falling apart and we begin to despair or be anxious about the future of our country, about the future of world order. We don't know if our kids are going to uh, be able to thrive as Christians in the culture that's emerging. We don't know if they're going to be be able to thrive as people in the culture that's emerging, in the economy that's emerging. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't minimize 
that feeling of uh, disorientation, worlds do die. Worlds collapse. That is the story, the regular uh, story of Scripture. Over and over again, God sets up a system, a world. It lasts for several hundred years. Then, because of human sin, it gets judged. It starts to fall apart. It starts to fray. It collapses. And then the world is gone. The Mosaic world, centered on the tabernacle, lasted from the time of Moses, from the time that the tabernacle was built at Sinai, and the law was given at uh, Sinai, through the period of the judges, into the late period of the judges, when the tabernacle was disrupted, torn apart, never put back together again, and the whole world of Israel, which was politically founded on the rule of ad hoc judges, and liturgically founded on worship in the tabernacle, that was just gone, and it never came back. A world died. Or even more drastically, think about what happens to Israel at the time of the exile. What makes Israel Israel? They've got a king in the line of David. They've got a temple in Jerusalem where they worship and where God has promised to be present to hear their prayers. They have a land that God promised to them. And suddenly, all of it is gone. Many of the Jews are not in the land. The temple is in ruins. The only Davidic kings that are still around are in exile in Babylon. Everything that made Judah, Judah is gone. And for 70 years, that's not, it doesn't exist. There is no temple for 70 years. There is no Davidic king. And the Davidic Davidic kingship is never restored in the form that it had been. They're restored to the land, but they're restored to the land under the oversight of other empires, Gentile empires. The old world of the Davidic monarchy ended and something different came into being. And that's a continuous occurrence. It's a regular occurrence. It's a continuous. It's a regular occurrence or a periodic occurrence. Let me say that in the Bible that worlds collapse, worlds come to an end. And of course it happens in the course of human history since uh, biblical times. As much as we still owe to the Roman Empire, we don't live under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire doesn't, Rome doesn't dominate uh, Europe the way it once did. The Roman Empire is gone, it collapsed at some point. The British Empire contracted, it's still got a commonwealth. Britain is still there, but the sun now does sort of set on the British Empire. It's not an empire anymore. It is certainly possible for that to happen to the United States. And what form that takes, I, I don't, I'm not here to predict. It could mean something like the British experience of contracting and becoming something like a second-rate power. That could happen with China and some other countries taking over global leadership that we have had for a century, uh, about a century, maybe more than a century. That could happen. Or we could fragment into regional clusters. Mm-hmm. Southeast becomes one country or a semi-independent region of the United States and the Northeast and the Pacific Coast, inland, inland Northwest becomes its own little, you could have that kind of thing happen, right? kind of balkanization of the United States. There's no guarantee that the system that exists now that we've become used to is going to exist in a hundred years. Worlds die uh, and, and systems collapse. And one of the things that you see, interestingly, recurring uh, through history and through scripture, it's a marker and a cause of those kinds of collapses, disease and pandemics. Uh, When when, uh, um, Jeremiah is prophesying about the end of Judah, he's prophesying right toward the end of the kingdom of Judah, just before the exile. He lives uh, through the time of the uh, Babylonian invasion and conquest. Uh, and as he's predicting what's going to happen, it's famine, sword, and pestilence. Those are the things that are going to come and bring judgment on Judah. Uh, there's a recent book. Uh, it wasn't. It was published before 2020, but it became obviously it became a, a hit uh, in in 2020. Uh, Kyle Harper, a, a 
I can't remember the title, something about the fall of Rome. And his uh, argument is that our, our standard accounts of the fall of Rome are all focused on bad political decisions. People making bad decisions that bring political collapse and imperial collapse. And he said in, in those kind of accounts, the environment is kind of a backdrop to the human drama. He says that's not actually how the collapse of Rome worked. For about 100 years, in the early couple of centuries AD, about 100 years, there were uh, repeated outbreaks of various kinds of plagues that killed thousands of people. I don't know how many people. They weren't like the, I don't think they were on the scale of the Black Death. But this was one of the things that caused the contraction of the Roman Empire, a contraction of this kind of globalized world, a semi-globalized world of the Roman Empire. Uh, pandemics are one of the things you see recurring again and again through history when you have uh, an expansion of interconnectedness across the globe. Uh, that, that happens over a course of several centuries. When it begins to contract, it's often associated with and sometimes in, in part caused by pandemics. If I'm going to bring disease by going and visiting India, I'm not going to go visit India anymore. We're going to set up our borders and keep other people, people out with their pathogens because people bring pathogens when they come into our country. So you have this kind of lockdown, uh, that's part of the, part of the story of uh, the collapse of, uh, of globalization. I think the problem that we have uh, culturally is even deeper. It's not just that we have upheaval, political upheaval, the upheavals of the pandemic, the response to the pandemic, which in my view was more catastrophic than, than the pandemic itself. We can discuss that if you like. <laughs> But I think the deeper problem is that in the modern world, in our current world, we do not have the resources to sustain hope through this kind of collapse. Our culture does not have the resources. When we think of ourselves in a postmodern world, that, that uh, phrase is bandied around, and one of the characteristics of postmodernity is skepticism about all of the glowing, uh, uh, the glowing visions of progress that the modern age had, had, had given birth to. I mean, there's a Marxist vision of a future uh, classless society. There's a kind of scientific technical vision of a, of a human society that's going to be perfected by the application of science. There's a democratic vision of a perfected human society. It's, if we spread democracy throughout the world, then everything will be peaceful because everyone will have a chance to uh, put his word, put his vote in uh, to decide who's going to be, is going to rule over them. We have these modern, these modern stories about progress and postmodernism is centrally a skepticism and loss of faith in those, in those uh, uh, stories. But I think that the, the stories themselves that modernity told us are, uh, are uh, fragile. They can't really sustain hope through uh, catastrophic events. Let me, let me highlight a couple of things that I think are features of the modern age, not just the postmodern period, but the modern age that leave us uh, without resources to sustain hope and expectation of future good. Uh, human autonomy is at the center of modernity. This is, the, this is the great enlightenment declaration. Grow up, be your own person, Kant says. Uh, uh, shed all of the traditions, critique all of the traditions. Don't accept something just because it's been done in the past. Uh, uh, grow out of your infancy and become fully adults. Uh, be autonomous, make your own decisions. Autonomy is the central impulse of the modern age. But autonomy is directly opposed to any notion of hope because hope is correlated to help. We hope for something outside of ourselves to uh, provide the resources that we don't have on our own. Uh, this is an insight that uh, William Lynch, a Jesuit psychologist, uh, brings out in a book called uh, Images of Hope. Uh, if, you, if you have somebody in your, you know, some of your counseling, a pastoral office, or you're just talking to a friend and they say, I'm just at the end of my rope. You say, buck up. You've got all the resources within you to solve your own problems. You can do this. You're an autonomous individual. And Lynch says, of course, that's exactly the opposite of what you mean to say, because they wouldn't be talking to you 
in this kind of hopeless way if they had any resources left because their end their end of their own resources but our whole culture is designed to facilitate and to encourage autonomy which undermines and uh, and uh, corrodes the possibility of hope and even those grand visions those grand visions of progress that the modern age has given us whatever whatever grand vision people are attached to it, technical vision technical scientific marxist democratic vision all of them are uh, visions of progress basically without god we're going to establish heaven on earth without jesus we're going to we have this grand story of human history human history is all about the progress of democracy and freedom around the world that's what it's all about there's a story to the world, but no storyteller. That's not sustainable. That's not coherent. If there is no storyteller, there is no story. There's no coherent, there's no coherent way of putting history together unless we impose our ideas on it. We project our ideas onto it and say, okay, we're going to make sure that the Marxist vision of progress is what's realized. We're going to make everybody conform to our vision. That's the only way to, to story. But then you've got a storyteller. <laughs> you've got the tyrant who becomes a storyteller. If you don't have a cosmic storyteller, you can't have a cosmic story. And so all of these modern stories of progress collapse of their own weight because they don't have, uh, they don't have God at the center. So in this kind of situation, Christians are called to what uh, the philosopher Jonathan Lear has called radical hope. That's the name of a book by Jonathan Lear. Lear's book is a fascinating study of the, uh, the life of a, I always forget what tribe he is. I don't know if he's a Creek Indian or Crow Indian. Maybe neither. His name is Plenty Coup, and he was the, tri the tribal leader of whatever tribe it was. <clears throat> as this tribe went through, the, uh, went through its collapse as an Indian tribe, <clears throat> and was incorporated into the United States. And Lear's looking at his life as an example of a kind of hope that is sustained and can envision a future that doesn't depend on any of the traditional resources or foundations. Of how do you sustain hope when everything that normally sustains hope, all your cultural resources have just disappeared? That's what radical hope is. When you maintain hope when all the cultural resources that sustain hope have collapsed. And I think that's what where we are as a culture. I think as Christians, we do have deep foundations for our hope, the deepest foundation for our hope. And so we can be a people that sustains hope in the midst of what may be a very serious uh, reshuffling of uh, the world system. We can sustain hope uh, and envision a world on the other side. So that's what I want to talk about. In, uh, now that the introduction is done, I can use up half my time in the introduction. So now I'm actually going to talk about a theology of hope, which is what I said I was going to talk about. Let me start doing that by looking at Romans 15, 13. Paul writes, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does the phrase God of hope imply? In what way is God the God of hope? Well, the context, this, the, the clause that follows that indicates that God is the God of hope because he's the source of hope. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. The God of hope will give you hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the source of the hope that is abounding within you. God is the God of hope because he's the source of hope. He's also the object of hope. And if you look at the previous verse, he's quoting a series of passages from the prophets. And verse 12 says, again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. There's going to be a Davidic king from the root of Jesse, a new David, is going to grow up, uh, and not only the Jews, 
but Gentiles are going to place their hope in him. Their expectations for future good are going to be directed to him. He's going to be the one that, one that guarantees their future good. So in the context where you have those different senses, God of hope, the God of hope is the God who's the source of hope. The God of hope is the object of our hope. But I want to raise the possibility that God of hope is actually describing something about God, not just as he is in relation to us, as the source of hope or the object of our hope, but that God himself is characterized by hope. That hope is somehow a feature of the life of the God that we worship, who is the Father, Son, and Spirit. When I think through this, we can start at, we can think about the three, what are called the three theological virtues in the Christian tradition. The three things that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love. And for, since, since the early centuries of the church, well, uh, John says it, God is love. That's, love is not just something God gives. Love is not just something God does, but God is love. Love is the, uh, the content, the reality of the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And from the early centuries, Christians have thought about this in terms of the Trinity. You have a father who loves his son by the Spirit. The Spirit is the love that the Father and the Son share. So God is a God of love, not just in giving love or as an object of love, but God is a God of love because he, confer, because he is love. Can we say that about faith? Is the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, the eternal life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, a life of continuous, eternal, perfect faith? Well, that sounds odd to us because we think of faith in self, salvific terms. Faith is the, uh, what's required of us in order to uh, receive the justification, the verdict of justification, we're justified by faith. But that's not the only sense of faith. It may, in fact, it may not be the deepest sense of faith. Faith is also trust. We live a life of faith, a life of faith, not just initially putting our trust in God, our faith in God, not just believing certain things to be true of God, but putting and trusting ourselves to God. Jesus does that to his father. The son in his incarnation entrusts himself to his father and trusts his father. He goes to the cross expecting his father, trusting his father to raise him from the dead. And that in the, that, uh, in that trust uh, between the father and the son in the life of Jesus is a revelation of the trust and loyalty and faithfulness that exists within the triune life itself. God is faith in something like the same way that God is love. After all, faithfulness, loyalty, is a feature of love. I love you, but I'm not going to be faithful to you. Doesn't, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in the life of God either. If God is love, then he is God. He's also God of faith. And faith is a character it characterizes the interaction, the eternal interaction, the eternal life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But can we say the same thing about hope? Now this again seems like it's a tough sell. Because I mentioned, as I said at the beginning, hope is an expectation of future good, of something in the future. And it's an expectation that has a degree of uncertainty about it. If we know something is going to happen, then we don't say we hope that it will happen. That, that doesn't fit the life of God, does it? God doesn't have expectations about the future that he doesn't know for certain. God doesn't exist in time like we do, anticipating things that are just over the horizon that we're not looking at. So whatever, if we can say that God is hope in the sense that God is love and God is faith, it's not the same as our hope. But I think it still makes some sense to say that God is hope. God is not in time. He's not bound by time. But God is Distinguished, there, there is a movement of in, within God. The Father begets the Son, and the Father and the Son breathe out the Spirit. There's a kind of, there is an origin, the Father. There's a movement from the Father, the beginning of the Son. 
There is a return to the Father. The Son's worship and glory, glorifying of His Father. There's a movement back and forth. The Father, you could say, bestows the Spirit of glory on His Son in expectation that the Son will return the glory to Him. Not in uncertainty, but there is this kind of movement that uh, depends on personal distinction between persons. It's not a temporal movement, but the distinctions among the three persons are the root of created time, the reason why we exist in time. It's not really a, a defect of human beings that we exist in time. It's a way, one of the ways that we image God. Our lives move from origin, they pass through a, a middle period and it come to an end. And that's reflecting the Father's origin, the Son as the one who accomplishes it, and the Spirit of one as one who completes. Our life in time is a reflection of the life of the Godhead. And I think on that basis we can say that God is not just love, not just faith, but God also is hope. And one of the things that opens up for us is the recognition that hope is not just something that's kind of on the margins of life. We think of hope as kind of a supernatural virtue, a theological virtue. It's something that we exercise as Christians, but we don't think about hope as kind of a natural phenomenon. But hope is built into created life. We're created as creatures of hope because we're created in the image of God who is hope. Such at least is my argument. How are we created as creatures of hope? Well, think about the original state of Adam. Adam was created, placed in the garden, I'm sure you've heard this from your pastors. He's created in the garden. You know that there are two trees in the garden. Adam has access to the tree of life. That's free for the taking. Nothing, he has to do nothing to receive it. But there's another tree, the tree of knowledge, that is not yet free for the taking, but will be. The setup in the Eden is not that Adam will always be prohibited from eating the tree of the knowledge. The setup is that he will trust God, receive the life that God has to offer from the tree of life, and that as he matures and grows and becomes more and more a son of God, that God will glorify him by giving him access to the tree of knowledge, which is a, a, a royal tree. It's a tree that uh, has to do with uh, knowledge, wisdom that's required for uh, mature judgment and royal uh, and rule. Adam has created a priest in the garden. He's given life. He's given access to the tree of life. He's supposed to grow up to become a king. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to grow up, in other words, in order to be glorified. He's created with an expectation of future glory. He's not going to be in a steady state. We say that Adam was created perfect, created sinless. <clears throat> but if perfect means fully realized as a human, not. He's not created fully realized as a human. He's created with hope that he will be fully realized as a human at some point in the future. But he's not yet. He's created in hope, and that expectation of future good is part of his, uh, part of the way he images the God of hope. You make the same point from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is talking about the resurrection body, but he refers back to the first Adam. Our bodies in death are sown a natural body. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 44. Sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Just as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became life-giving spirit. See the correlations that he has here. Natural body, spiritual body, correlates to Adam and Christ. The last Adam. Natural, spiritual Adam, Christ. And what Paul says in verse, at the end of verse 44 is that if there is a natural body, an Adamic body, then there is also a spiritual body, a glorified body, like Christ's resurrected body. The, the possibility of that future resurrected, glorified spiritual body is not premised on the fall. It's not premised on... Uh, on the need for salvation, as soon as God has created Adam, Adam is on a path, a, a trajectory toward 
glorified resurrection spiritual body. At some point, we don't know how this would have happened because it didn't. <laughs> Adam didn't wait long enough to let it happen. But at some point, Adam would have been transformed from natural to spiritual. <clears throat> he would have been somehow sown as natural and raised in glory. He's created with hope for glory. I and mean, we see this all the time, right? This is, this is the way human beings operate. We're created with expectation of future glory. Why do people, why do men especially, but why do people compete in sports? Because they want to glorify themselves. And that can get twisted, of course, and that's perverted. But it's a perversion of a natural, created, godly expectation and desire for glory. God created us to become glorious. He wants us to become glorious. We seek glory in all the wrong ways. We seek glory from all the wrong sources. But at base, that desire for glory is a proper one. And it's built into us. We're creatures desiring, uh, creatures uh, who are created with hope for glory. Or even, you know, just to take it down from the exalted realm of sports. Just to, you know, why, why do you get up in the morning? Why do you roll out of bed? Why don't you just turn over and keep sleeping for a while? Because you have hope. You think that there's some good that will come from you rolling out of bed and giving your energy to something other than sleeping for the day. Everything we do, this, this is a, a, an axiom for Thomas Aquinas, Everything we do is done for an end. We always act for some expected end point. And when, when, we, when we start out on a project, the project is always guided in the first instance by what we want to achieve down the road. And then all of the, uh, all of the things that we do in order to reach that end are dependent on, what, on, on the end that we're trying to reach. It's that future point that future glory, that future achievement that guides all the specifics that we do. You want to build a house, you have a vision of what the house is going to be, and you get the materials and the uh, workmen and the timetable and every, you can line up everything so that you can achieve that end. You start a business and you have some expectation of a future business hope for a future business, and that determines all the steps you take in order to get that business off the ground. We're created to be, we're created as beings of hope. Uh, we're, we're created to, um, with, uh, as creatures who are on a quest or on pilgrimage, created to be on pilgrimage toward God's glory, to be sharers in God's glory. But even when that's perverted, we're still uh, acting in expectation of future hope. Of course, as I said, this, these things, can, our hope can go wrong. Our hope can be, be perverted. Our hope for glory, which is good, there's nothing wrong with hope for glory. That's what we're created for. Our hope for glory, which is good, can be perverted into evil kinds of rivalries mm -hmm. when we think that the only way for us to get glory is to make sure that the other guy doesn't get any glory. And we... we, we, we pummel him and stamp him down so that we can, we can achieve all the glory. Or we hope for the wrong things. Our desires are set on the wrong things because our hearts are perverse. Or we look to the wrong sources for the good that we hope for. That is, we set up idols. If only I can get this job or have this income or get this wife or this husband. If only this then that will, that will achieve all my fondest wishes and hope. I will have everything I want if I can achieve this. We're looking for uh, a, 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 a fullness and a satisfaction that these things are not intended to give us. Those have become idols. Our hopes get perverted. But again, at the root, those hopes are created in us. They're proper and they're part of human life as such. And what the gospel does is reorient our hope back to God. It corrects our hope, restores our hope, 
when our hopes have become uh, weak, when we are without God and without hope in the world, as Paul says of the Gentiles, uh, God revives hope and reorients our hopes back to himself, back to the proper ends of our hope, and we begin to hope for the right things and seek the goods, the future goods that we want and we desire from the right sources. That is, we seek all good and perfect gifts from our Heavenly Father. The gospel is a message of hope. It's a revelation of the God of hope. It's a fulfillment of the hopes of Israel. This is Paul's constant message in the book of Acts, particularly as you get to the end of the book of Acts, when Paul is going uh, from one governor's court to another. And everywhere he goes, he says, I am on trial for the hope of Israel. What I'm, proclaim what I'm proclaiming is hope, fulfilled hope. All the things that Israel wanted have finally come to pass in Jesus. And that's what I'm proclaiming. It's a message of hope. Well, I think the gospel also gives us a renewed experience of hope. It's a message of hope. But it also gives us a new experience of hope. I think an unprecedented experience of hope. Because the gospel gives us a realized hope. That is, God, God has given us the things that we hope for now before the full realization of those things that we hope for. Think of a, a, a Hebrews 11, beginning of verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen is one of possible translation. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If we have faith, faith in Jesus, then the substance, the reality of what we hope for is ours. I said at the beginning that hope is directed toward future good, but the gospel gives us what we hope for in the present, as well as a fullness of what we hope for in the future, a fullness of what we already possess in the future. Hebrews 11 uh, describes it as, uh, as a substance of things hoped for, or Colossians 1.27. Paul proclaims the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Christ is in me, then that's something that's presently true of me. That's not something that I'm expecting at some point in the future. Christ already dwells in me, but the Christ who dwells in me embodies the hope for future glory that I was created to realize, or I was created to reach. And I already have it, because Christ dwells in me. And that's the kind of root, the radic, the radix of radical hope that we need in the midst of all of the turmoil of the present time. A radical hope for Christians doesn't simply mean that we have unerring hope or uh, uh, un, uh, uh, enduring hope. It means the hope that we have is rooted in God's own presence with us. God, who is the God of hope, God who is already, who is himself, embodies and lives a life of faith, hope, and love. That God dwells in us. And so our hope, our experience of hope, doesn't depend on, you know, putting a bright, uh, putting a, a, a happy face on everything. Our hope doesn't depend on circumstances around us. Hope depends on maintaining communion with the God of hope who dwells in us. Our hope is kind of a, an overflow of the life of God within us, of the life of the Spirit that dwells in us. And because that is the root of our hope, because our hope is rooted in God himself, our hope is, does endure, and our hope has, uh, transform, has transforms us. Because our hope is rooted in God himself, our hope can be hope against hope, as, uh, as uh, Abraham's was. Romans 4, that's Paul's, Paul's phrase in Romans 4. Abraham hoped against hope. 
And we can experience that because the God of hope, who is our hope, who's our object of our hope, but the God of hope who's, who is also, whose life itself is a life of hope, dwells in us. Our hope can be sustained through tribulations. After Romans 4 comes Romans 5. And Romans 5, Paul says that we exalt in our tribulations because of the result of those tribulations, which are these. Tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proving character, proving character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. So tribulations don't destroy our hope. In fact, they produce hope. They strengthen hope. If our hope is rooted in God, if our hope is because God has rooted himself in us, if that's the source of our hope, then our tribulations and the troubles around us don't, uh, don't affect that. Hope does not disappoint. The hope that is produced by our tribulations, that perfected by our tribulations, is not disappointed. Hope makes us younger. As Thomas Aquinas says this. <coughs> hope youth and us. Thomas Aquinas' explanation is that uh, as we're, when we're young, we're brimming, brimming with hope because we have all this time ahead of us. We can accomplish anything in the decades and decades that we have ahead of us. When you get to a certain age, there's more decades behind than there are ahead. <laughs> and that expectation of what you can accomplish, we can hope for, begins to shrink. And for a lot of people, that's a massive crisis. Because all your, all your youthful expectations, are, your youthful expectations, you haven't fulfilled them. You're disappointed. You can become embittered at God, at life. But Aquinas says, somebody who's hoping for eternal life, somebody who has a Christian hope, has always has an infinite amount of time ahead of them. It doesn't shrink. You can be around forever. You're not going to be around forever in this body, in this, in this life. You're going to be around forever. And I think that's a real phenomenon. I mean, I'm sure it's, uh, you know older people who maintain a kind of youthful vigor and hope, even though they, you know, their, their life has contracted to maybe a few years is all they have left. But they remain buoyant and youthful in the midst of that. Thomas also says that hope is irascible. Irascible. Irascible has the, the Latin root ira, angry. Hope is fierce. We think of hope as, I think it's, we typically think of it as a kind of soft virtue. <laughs> it's kind of a passive virtue, but Thomas doesn't think of it that way. Hope is irascible. And it's, it's like a, if you're hoping for something and an obstacle comes in your way. And now you're directing your ire, your ira, at the obstacle so that you can break through the obstacle and reach the hoped for result. Genuine hope makes you irascible in that sense. Not, not, uh, it doesn't make you, uh, it doesn't make you uh, irascible in a more common sense, just uh, that you're uh, difficult to get along with. But it makes you irascible because you're fierce in pursuing the proper glory that you were created for. Hope makes us audacious. It makes us audacious. Attempting things that seem Irrational, attempting things that seem like they can't possibly happen. Because we trust in a God who has infinite resources, because we trust in a God who not only has infinite resources, but also has given us himself and dwells in us as the hope of glory. So uh, the, main, the main thing I want to get across is that point about God's dwelling in us. Because that is the that truly is the root of our experience of hope and our the stability of our hope. It's not because of what we can gin up. It's because God has given, not just given hope to us, but God has given himself to us as the God of hope. That's what will sustain our hope through whatever trying times lie ahead. Let's pray together. 
Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for uh, your promise that you will bring us to glory, you will bestow glory. We thank you for the fulfilled promise that Christ dwells in us as our hope of glory. And we pray that we would continue in communion with him, that we would keep in step with your spirit, that the hope that is your life would live in and through us. And so in the midst of a confused and anxious and fearful world, that our hope would shine out and would attract many to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.